The message is entitled, as we've already mentioned, God and Country. It was an interesting thing. If you followed the news this week, there was a story that came out about a prayer breakfast that was held in Washington, D.C. for Republican presidential hopeful Tim Scott. Maybe some of you saw this story. Uh, the controversy was that uh, the congresswoman from South Carolina, Nancy Mace, got up and gave an introduction, and she made some public comments uh, and in the course of doing so, she mentioned that she had woken up that morning uh, sleeping with her fiancé, uh, whose name was Patrick. And there was a lot of comments about the comment that she made, but the, 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 the point of controversy and the point of interest for our purposes here today is that at a presumably Christian event, like a prayer breakfast, it was interesting that the congresswoman did not seem to think that it was out of place to publicly acknowledge the cohabitation before marriage and basically practicing premarital sex. And this kind of invites the question for our purposes here today, is the United States a Christian nation? Do we live in a country that can be accurately described as a Christian nation? Giving you some things to think about, but it probably here depends a little bit on what we mean by Christian. And Pastor uh, Mark, Mark was here with us this morning, just gave the report. During the Sunday school hour, he very artfully took us through 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where Paul lays out for us what is the gospel. We would understand in one sense that when we talk about who is a Christian, a true Christian is inherently defined and identified by the gospel, that person's relationship to the gospel, which involves a relationship with God, their creator that's made possible because Jesus, the Son of God, died on the cross to give up his life so that we could have salvation. He paid the penalty and we believe in him. We believe in what Jesus Christ provides for us. But as Mark also acknowledged, whether he said it exactly this way or not, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that you would hold fast, that you would continue in a life of faith and believing in Jesus Christ. And so while we aren't going to say precisely that in order to be fully and completely regenerate, you must live consistently, we understand that faith is the, the gift of grace that God gives to us. It is not anything we can do to earn it. There's not anything we can do to hold on to it. On the other hand, we would also understand that to be identified publicly as a faithful Christian requires a level of adherence to that is the evidence of God working in your life. Uh, that you are doing what God wants us to do. We as a church are teaching others to follow the Great Commission, which is that we are to teach others everything that Christ commanded. They are to know, among other things, going back to our opening story and illustration, that a faithful Christian, somebody who is living like a follower of Jesus Christ, understands that that has some implications to how we live our life sexually. It has some, uh, some definition to what it means to be married or not married. It has some definition and implications into how we speak with each other, honesty, integrity, not taking things that belong to others, by being kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Those things are part of what it means to be a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. And if you are not living like that, that doesn't necessarily mean that God pulls away salvation from you, but it does mean that if you aren't living consistently, we would say maybe that person is not living like a Christian ought to. He is not identifying with Christ in the way that he or she orders his or her life. So, we would understand initial faith is important if you're going to be identified as a Christian, but we would also say ongoing faith is an important part of identity with Christ. On the other hand, now stay with me here for a minute, 
That is what it means to be a Christian. But we're still trying to think through what does it mean to be a Christian nation? Is the United States a Christian nation? Let me see a show of hands here. How many of you had the privilege of being raised in a Christian home? You would say, I was raised in a Christian home. Hands all over the auditorium. Not everybody, but many of us were. What do we mean by that? That is a Christian home. Is one automatically a Christian by virtue of one's birth? Well, we could sometimes maybe practically think of it that way, maybe even in other church traditions where you're born into a home with believing parents. What do they do? They take the little infant and take him down to the baptismal font. Uh, the, the pastor, the priest, the, the father will sprinkle uh, that child's head and initiate them into a relationship with the church and with Christ. This is a Calvary Baptist church. We don't do that not just because we're Baptist and not Lutheran or Catholic or Presbyterian or whatnot, we would base our understanding and practice on the Word of God. We would see in the Great Commission, which we've already quoted, that you are to teach the nations, that is, present the gospel, and then as we make disciples, teach, put them in front of the gospel, after they receive the gospel, the next step is baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and then teaching them to observe all things that Christ has commanded. There is an order. There is a pattern. So, in order for somebody to be a Christian, to be included into the body of Christ, requires faith. But we would also understand in this context that if you are raised in a Christian home, you have believing parents who are seeking to influence you from your earliest days. I I mean, myself, I would describe myself as having been raised in a Christian home, and I am told that 10 days after I was born, I was in church. (laughs) I was in the nursery. I don't have that much of a recollection of it, but from my earliest cognizant memories, I can tell you, I was in church. In fact, the way I learned how to read, as I remember it as a kid, is I would look at the hymnal while we were singing, and I wanted to figure out what the words were, so I I tried to make those connections. I could hear what was being sung, and I matched it with what was on the paper, and my mom and dad told me I was reading by four years old, (laughs) partly because I was regularly getting exposed to these things. I had that influence. I made a profession of faith in Christ early on in my life. I was actually not quite five years old when I first began to understand that I was a sinner. I didn't do everything my mom and dad wanted me to do. I wasn't concerned. And I knew that I deserved punishment for my sin. I'd heard that in Sunday school. I'd heard that from my mom and dad. And these were things that I was raised in that influence. I wasn't automatically a Christian because I was raised in a Christian home. But being under that regular influence exposed me to the truth of the gospel from a young age, and it was true for so many of you as well, whether it was being actively taught at home or they were making sure that you were coming to church, that you were enrolled maybe in a Christian school. We would use it that way too. As a Christian school, are all the students believers? Not necessarily. You'd hope that they were, but there is still that influence, that teaching that's regularly happening To be raised in a Christian home does not make someone a Christian any more than to live in Rochester, Minnesota makes you an employee of the Mayo Clinic, but we would also understand we have a little level of familiarity and exposure that other people might not have. Today's passage does not directly address the matter of a nation's Christian identity, but what we do see in the passage today are some helpful principles to think through as we consider God, as we consider the gospel, and we consider the role in how a Christian considers civic responsibility, our relationship with our neighbors, our relationship with our nation. So what I want to do, without answering the question at least yet, whether or not we're a Christian nation, is allow God's Word to speak, to shape our mind, to shape our thoughts on this particular topic. So let's look at 
Acts chapter 18. We'll be focusing on the first 17 verses of the chapter this morning. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. As you follow along, the words will be here on the screen as well. Hear the Word of God. Luke writes, After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade the Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ, or the Messiah, was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord, together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many people in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. But when Gallio, the proconsul of Achaia, uh, the, when, when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. And they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. This is the word of God, inerrant, infallible, inspired, written by God and written for us that we might know what to believe, that we might know how to live, that on its pages we might meet the living Christ. May God add his blessing here to the reading of his word this morning. As we try to think through this idea of what makes a nation Christian or not, what is our responsibility to our nation in this, what I want us to first of all understand as we look at your outline here on the sheet this morning, is that we would say, taking away from this passage, God orders society. God orders society. I see here four different ways where God is involved in this. This isn't an exhaustive list, but this is something we can derive directly from the text. First of all, we would see that God is involved in establishing expectations for economics of a society, for economics. We're introduced in the text early to Aquila and Priscilla, who not only seem to have a relationship with Paul because of common ethnicity, and we will say here in just a moment, develop this, faith in Jesus, but they have a business relationship. They're tent makers, and Paul is a tent maker, and they start working together to be productive, to earn a living for Paul and to enable his work. This helps us understand, among other things, that when we look at Scripture, work is not a curse. Sometimes we lazily might draw that conclusion because, after all, Adam and Eve were in the garden, and now, as part of the curse of sin, uh, Adam is told he is going to produce things by the sweat of his brow. But you have to understand, yes, there is an element of unpleasantness now because of the curse of sin that is going to be introduced into our experiences. There are going to be thorns and thistles. There's going to be things that work against us, but before the fall, what do we have? Adam and Eve are told to have dominion over God's creation. They are pointed out at the garden and said, you are to work the garden. You are to subdue it, bring it under control, till it, keep it. You're going to be productive. You're going to be producing children, having these, these kind of things. Those things take effort. It's not just like you go to the machine and 
out pops a piece of fruit or out pops a kid who's all ready to go, you, you're still going to have to teach them, instruct them, give them things. You're going to have to have a responsibility. There is something there that God has given them as a responsibility and as a blessing. There is something to be said there about productivity, but also the reward that productivity gives to us. The sense of purpose, the sense of completion, the sense of satisfaction. I, I think I mentioned this last week. Hayden was kind of sad because last week with his brothers gone to camp, we had all this rain and we had a lawn to mow. And so he was expecting, he said, Dad, after you gave that illustration last week, you're going to teach me how to mow the lawn, aren't you? <laughs> and we actually worked on it, but we determined that this summer he's still a little too short and we have a little bit of an incline in the front yard. Uh, and so Dad took over and I got to mow the lawn and he got to do some weeding, which he thoroughly enjoyed and did a great job eventually. <laughs> But as we worked through that, there was a sense not only of working in the heat and working in the accomplishment, working through the challenges of that, but when we were done, there was a sense of reward. There was a sense of completion that came through that. And now, look at all the things that we can enjoy because we have accomplished that task. And I believe that's a gift from God that we have that sense of purpose, that sense of definition. We are to be understanding that that's part of how God has ordered the world as well. In the economic setting that he's given to us, he intends people to be productive. He has given them the need to be responsible to manage things. We saw this actually looking at the text last week when we were in Acts 17, 26, Paul talking to the Athenians at the Areopagus, and he says, and he made in verse 26 of Acts 17, from one man, that's Adam, every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling places. And so God has ordained nations to be sovereign over these regions, over the things that are going on in the world, and to manage the societies that live under their jurisdiction. Job makes this, in, in Job there's this observation made as well. God makes the nations great, and he destroys them. He enlarges nations and leads them away. That's Job 12, 23, if you want to jot that reference down for later. God provides for his creation out of the resources that he provides to us, out of the things that he has made. The psalmist says in Psalm 50, 10, for every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. We are all familiar with that phrase. This is where we get it from in Psalm 50. God says, I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, God says, I would not tell you for the world and its fullness are mine. These are things that belong to him and the things that we have, whether it's the things we're eating off our table, the things that we're using to sell and, and create a life for ourselves and, and have income and so forth, nations that have natural resources, sometimes we say, these things are belonging to God. He has entrusted to us for His purposes and for our benefit. And so, what are we supposed to do with these resources? Work at them. Work to acquire. Work to be productive. Proverbs 6.6, 6, Go to the ant, O sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, the ant prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. And so, this, the, the author of Proverbs, Solomon here rebukes, How long will you lie there, O sluggard? Don't be unproductive. Don't give yourself to sloth and indolence and depending on other people. Don't depend on a government handout or a government program. If you have help, you have capability, you're supposed to go out and earn a living for yourself. The New Testament will actually go on to say, not just to provide for yourself, but to, you can have to give to those in need. These are biblical values, biblical priorities that God expects us to follow through with. Second Thessalonians, Paul, who is working here as a tent maker, would rebuke the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians 3.6. We command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother, that is, any other person who claims to be a Christian, who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. 
For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor we worked day and night, that we may not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right. In other words, persons who are in gospel ministry have the right to understand that there is appropriate compensation. More on that in just a moment. But to give you in ourselves, Paul says, an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. And as you continue to study that passage in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, Paul is giving himself an example. This is something that every believer should do. They should be productive. The problem that they had in 2 Thessalonians was the church believed so much in the imminent return of Christ, everybody stopped working. Jesus is coming back. What's the point in anything else? There is a point. This is what God has called us to do, and we need to work to be productive. We need to work to empower ministry. We need to be busy about serving the needs of interests of others, because this is what God has called us to do. This is how God gets glory. In fact, even when it comes to the qualifications for those serving in leadership and church leadership and vocational ministry, the expectations are that they know how to provide for their own household. First Timothy 5.8, if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household, you hear this, what Paul says? He has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Say, so what does that have to do with the gospel, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection? It doesn't, but somebody who believes is going to be responsible. And these are, there's going to be applications of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, what it means to be a child of God. So God does care very much about the economics of a nation. He cares much about economics of how we live and practice as individuals. God orders society in economics. He orders society, as we see in this passage in Acts chapter 18, with uh, matters of ethnicity, economics, and now ethnicity. You can see as we survey the first 17 verses of Acts chapter 18, it's a sensitive issue. There are tensions between ethnic groups, their cultures, religions, and interests. It starts right in verse 2. And it, as Luke says, he found a Jew named Aquila, Paul, is, Paul that is, a native of Pontius, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. And why are they there in Corinth? Because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. We might assume that this is because they are Christians, but that's not what Luke says. What does he say? They are outside of Rome because of an ethnic divide, because they were singled out because of their Jewish heritage. There are ongoing tensions between the Jews of that day living in Rome and the Roman government. There are going to be ongoing tensions in this passage with Gallio in verse 14, Sosthenes being beaten in Acts 18, 17. There, there, there are things that are going on, conflict, because you're a Jew and I'm not. I'm Greek or I'm Roman or, 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 or whatever the case might be. What I'm trying to help you illustrate is when we see things going on in our world, our society, even here in our state, the, the Floyd riots that happened here that are still very vivid in most of our memories, Paul and his contemporaries, too, lived in a world where ethnic tensions were embedded in the culture. And how are we supposed to think through that as Christians? Jesus Christ, for the individual Christian, reminds us that he himself, quoting Ephesians 2.14, is our peace. There is no conflict between people now who are in Christ because Jesus has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. You say, well, that would be nice, Pastor, but that's not how the rest of the world works. That's not how the rest of the world thinks. And you might be right. That doesn't mean that we aren't called to make a difference, to model something in contrast to the rest of the world around us. The church should not be a haven for 
old ideas of, of hate, and, you know, let's have them do their church over there, and we'll do this church over there. There are going to be some practical reasons why maybe we have to have Calvary Baptist Church and upstairs in our facility right now, Rochester Chinese Christian Church is meeting. But friends, I'll tell you one thing, it's not because we have different skin colors and different cultures. The thing that divides us is because they're speaking a language that we don't. And there's a communication thing there. But one of the reasons we can meet under the same roof is this, because we believe the same gospel. We believe there is unity to be shared in Jesus Christ. And that's something we need to continue to work for. That's something that needs to be an ongoing conversation. That we are one people, united under one Savior, teaching one message. And as their generation continues, and as our generation continues, you look across this room, there are people who have shared ethnic ethnic and cultural things, but we are delighted that it is still a variety. I got to meet the Alex cousins here from California this morning. These are first generation and second generation immigrants from Russia. What a blessing to be united under the truth of the gospel, to have people from Nigeria, Sudan, to have a pastor who's half Filipino. I mean, we have all kinds of things. We have a missionary from Brazil. There's lots of different things going on which remind us, friends, that the church should be a model of what it means to be unified as a society. Yes, there can be practices and principles that get incorporated into our national policy on these things, but Christians should be the one modeling what it means to be together, what it means to put aside our differences and to embrace love, to embrace a lack of conflict, to embrace peace because of Jesus Christ. God has a specific expectation for ethnic unity because 1 Peter 2.9 reminds us as believers, we are part of a chosen nation, a royal priesthood, a people for God's own possession. I still learned at King James, so it's a peculiar people, but still, you, you get the idea. We're not all normal, but we're called together to be something radically different than the world around us, which brings us to God's idea of what it means to have united spirituality. God has some purposes and directions, has some thoughts for us to consider even here in Acts chapter 18. Claudius' expulsion of the Jews may not have been, even though he sent them out of Rome because they were Jewish, may not have just been because they were Jewish. If you do some research in why Claudius expelled the Jews from Rome, there's reason to conclude that it was partly because the Jews were having an internal conflict among themselves because they couldn't agree on whether Jesus was the Messiah or not. And the uproar, the tumult, got so animated and so heated that Claudius, the emperor, finally said, you guys just need to to clear out of here. You're causing too much difficulty with all this internal contention, and so find somewhere else. We're not going to have that conflict here. But what we can learn from that, friends, is this. The gospel should always transcend ethnic and cultural lines, but it is not something for a government to have to implement. A government, we expect these things to be advanced because the government is mandating the Ten Commandments or is mandating everybody subscribe to this particular school of thought or religion. We live in a country that was founded as, yes, one nation under God, but there is religious liberty as part of living here in the United States. You go back to our history, and you have a a state like Maryland that was predominantly populated by Roman Catholics, hence the Mary Land. But you also had Congregationalists, and you had the Puritans and the Pilgrims who were settling, who weren't necessarily, by the way, religiously united. They were opponents of each other. But there was ongoing, we have Rhode Island with Roger Williams, our Baptist forefather over there, 
there are things that are happening in our society that show that we want to be a nation of plurality, that we can have different avenues, different kinds of emphases, and different kinds of, if you want to say religions, denominations, whatever you would have, but we have the freedom to think through. Even going to Utah, and you see some of the things that are emphasized there with LDS people over there. We don't subscribe, we don't endorse, but neither do we want to legislate that they should not be able to draw those conclusions. Part of where we are as a country is allowing ourselves to come to a place where we believe, where we draw these conclusions because we are persuaded and convinced by the Spirit and truth, this is how we come to faith in Christ. And that needs to have a little bit of liberty or freedom so that environment gives people the chance to respond. And again, just speaking, if we want to take a step back and put on my denominational hat, if you will, uh, that I'm a Baptist. Yes, I am a Baptist, and you should be too if you're sitting here this morning, or we're trying to persuade you maybe. But there's a difference between the way we think that way versus maybe some of our Pado baptist friends, where they're baptizing infants, bringing them in. There's a mindset there where you can have people who are born into a Christian home, born into the church. They've been lifetime members. And that's how sometimes we saw that developing in European history, where you have a state church, whether you're, it's the Episcopal Anglican Church in England or the Lutheran Church in Germany, so on and so forth. You have Roman Catholics who are dominating uh, Europe at one point in time. There's an automatic introduction in there because of how they interpret what they mean by baptizing into, including, and so on and so forth. But as Baptists, we inherently understand that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. And that's how you're added to the church. It's through belief, and that is confirmed by baptism, but it's not conditional. It is signifying, here is what you have done. And you have believed in Jesus Christ. So, we would understand that spirituality requires the message and requires the message to be responded to individually, putting your faith and trust, responding to the truth of Jesus Christ. Economics, ethnicity, spirituality. This text also helps us understand that God does have a plan and expectation for justice. Justice, that's the final point here on this part of the outline. God intends governments to uphold righteousness. However, governments being made up of flawed human beings do not always fulfill their responsibilities. As you see in verse 17, there would have been maybe a chance where we would say, if, if you're not reading carefully, Gallio kind of is the hero of the story because he comes and says, Paul, Paul wants to proclaim the gospel, and now Gallio comes to Paul's defense. But if you read carefully, you see that's actually not the case. Gallio is just a little bit late. He doesn't want to deal with the conflict. Get out of my courtroom. You're messing things up. You're interrupting my day, basically. And then the, the mob kind of takes over Sosthenes. There's that ethnic conflict again. And they beat him, and Gallio says, I'm not going to be bothered by that. That's not my deal. I don't want to deal with the drama. That's not justice. That's not a responsible civic leader and administrator. But what we do see from the text of Scripture is that God, as we've already said, establishes nations with their boundaries, and God has expectations on what a good government should look like. Listen to Romans 13. Let every sub person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. In other words, he's authorizing their capital punishment. For he is God, the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. 
Therefore, as a citizen, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. There's somebody meddling in their things. Yes, but a faithful Christian is going to be faithful at paying his taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay therefore to all what is to to, to what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Which, by the way, doesn't just talk about our taxes, but maybe talks about how we interact with leaders with whom we disagree with when we vent on the internet. Let the hearer understand. Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, these are God's commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires." So while Paul starts about talking our relationship with government and, in, and tells about what God has authorized and for them to do, he quickly makes the application, you have a responsibility, but you have a bigger responsibility to your neighbors and to your world. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on his armor. Make no provision for the flesh. Live in such a way where you, the next point on our outline, will put Jesus on display. You are putting him on display to a world who needs to see him, a world who needs to hear you talking about him. We can do this, as we see in the text, in three different ways. First of all, like Paul is doing there at the beginning of the chapter again, he's working. He's being productive. They are laboring to support themselves. Paul is laboring more hard and more tenaciously to make disciples in Corinth. So he's not just making tents, but it says he stays there in Corinth for a year and a half to teach, to engage, to point people to Jesus Christ. And the inclusion of not one, but two letters, 1 and 2 Corinthians in the New Testament, reminds us that Paul's efforts were definitely blessed and used by God. There were conversions that were made. His work paid off. God blessed him, and God blessed his labors. He was able to do that because he worked, but friends, we also remind ourselves here, even as we have a missionary with us this morning, that one of the reasons he was so effective and able to do that, putting Jesus on display, is because believers gave. People give to the work that God has called, and that's the next point on your outline. His work was, yes, enabled and empowered by the Holy Spirit, but it was also pushed forward by the generosity of God's people. How did Paul and and the first journey, Barnabas, go out? It was because the church at Antioch commissioned them and sent them out. Paul worked, but this is not something that he is doing consistently. He tells the Corinthians later on in 1 Corinthians 9, 13, do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service, so he's talking about Old Testament dispensation, get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in their sacrificial offerings. In other words, the priests get to eat the showbread. The priests get to eat the, the meat from the, sacrifices, from the sacrificial animals that are offered in the temple. They're making a living off of what they do for work. So Paul says in verse 14, in the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. You folks care for Pastor John and I, and you care for us very generously, and we thank you for that. That's part of where your offerings go. Not all of it, but that's part of where your offerings go. But you're enabling us to do work. You're enabling me to study and prepare for this. You're enabling Pastor John to spend what now? At least a full week, and not to mention all the car trips back and forth to camp, 
to invest in young people in their lives, to make sure that they're being shepherded and discipled, to make sure good communication is going, to make sure that we can support missionaries like Mark and Anita uh, and, the Zama, and Liza, Lisa Zamar that's coming. We just had, uh, we're going to have with us the Mwindis. They're, they're people that are circulating through that we have a relationship with because that's where our monies are going. They're investing in gospel proclamation. This is how we, as a congregation, can actively have a role in putting Jesus on display. But friends, you do it not just through giving money, but giving out the gospel, as we've talked about several times already this morning. You can engage with others in the truth of Jesus Christ. But even here in this text, we see that Paul's ministry is not just because of the church in Antioch, We've seen earlier he stays in the home of Lydia. It depends on her resources. Even here in this chapter, in verse 7, where is he staying? The house of Titius Justus. Friends, let me remind you that this reminds us that God's work is empowered and supported and enabled by God's faithful people. Not just the ones doing the proclaiming, but it requires people to support. We give, we work, but ultimately, we rely on God. We trust in Him to give His blessing. We are called, yes, to labor faithfully, but the end results are not always ours to determine. We must have faith. The author of Hebrews says in Hebrews 11:6, without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he, whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists and that God rewards those who seek Him. We must believe that He can do the work that He has faithful to what he has said. He is faithful to know that we who are sinners, we who are not able to produce anything of our own, are given salvation freely, fully, and completely because of what Jesus Christ has done. He has given us a commission to work on, and yet sometimes we aren't seeing results like we might like to. We wonder why aren't things happening? Why aren't we seeing more conversions? Why aren't we seeing like Peter did, 3,000 souls. As Norm Smith told us just a couple of weeks ago, Peter saw 3,000 souls. Stephen saw 3,000 stones. Why? Why can that be both true in serving a faithful God? Well, the author of Hebrews reminds us of that as well in Hebrews 11.39. Talking about all those Old Testament saints that he goes through and lists, and all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised. But why does God allow that to happen? Here's what he says. Since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. Now in that sense, he's saying they were looking ahead towards Jesus Christ. They were looking ahead with expectation. We, as New Testament believers, are looking back on what Jesus Christ has done for us. We can respond to that in faith. But we also understand that God wants us to labor faithfully. And we leave it up to Him in His timing and in His sovereignty to produce the results. The Old Testament saints didn't always know all that prosperity and all the, the joy that we have. They were still looking ahead to something that had not yet been fulfilled. But we can also understand from their example that we wait patiently on God and rely on Him to bring it to pass. We trust in God and expect God to do the work in His time and in His way. As a great missionary, William Carey, once said, we attempt great things for God and then we step back and expect great things from God when He brings them to be. So we ask a question at the beginning. Is America a Christian nation? You say, well, pastor, you've gone all over the place. I, I forgot you even said that now. But here's the conclusion. How can we think through that? If we're talking about the United States being a nation that is made up primarily of people who have professed faith in Jesus Christ as Savior, and they live their lives according to the principles that are set forth in God's Word, are we living in a Christian nation? I think most of us would have to conclude absolutely not. We live in a world where there's full of all kinds of examples of people living as unregenerate people, even people who don't have anything to do the way that they order their lives with what God's expectations are. And it's been that way 
at least in my lifetime, for as long as I can remember. We live in a society that is living in open rebellion, often against God and His truth. But like we talked about with a Christian home, if that home has believing parents who are raising their children under the influence of Christ and His Word, acknowledging the influence of our country as a Christian nation, in some contexts might be a helpful descriptor. After all, it's still illegal to commit murder. That's one of God's commands, isn't it? We still have property laws. There are, there are consequences if you steal something. There, there, are, there are ways that we are seeing these things change, too. We've seen in our lifetime the open acceptance of, of same-sex relationships. We've seen the breakdown of the definition of marriage that has been enti- uh, incorporated into our uh, civic laws. We have seen the legislation and acceptance of abortion for our lifetime, but praise God, we've seen some of those things change in our lifetime too. And for that, we can thank the Lord. But there is no doubt that as we look at the state of our nation and the state of the world that we live in, that a nation that was founded on principles consistent with the Bible's sense of morality, virtues, and justice, we live in that, that kind of a country compared to some of the nations of the world around us. But there's also little doubt that the state of our nation and the way that it has been administered is more and more contrary to the Scripture, contrary to God's Word, and it has been like that for a very long time. So do we live in a Christian nation? I'll leave you to answer that in your own mind, in your own heart. But what is our responsibility to the nation that we live in? Whether we live in the United States, whether we live in Brazil, whether we live in Japan, wherever we're coming from. Friends, each believer has this responsibility. How do we make a difference where we live? God says to Zechariah in Zechariah 4, 6, this is the word of the Lord, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. So we might say it this way, friends. Our job as Christians is to follow Jesus And as we do so, we change the world around us. Follow Jesus and change your world. And that's the final point there on your outline as we conclude. So what are the tools that we've been given to follow Jesus as New Testament believers in New Testament churches? We have the indwelling of the Spirit of God to empower us. We have the unchanging truth of God's Word to arm us. We have been given the task of proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, and by this we engage others with that gospel truth. We have the power of prayer to enlist the help of God Himself in what He's called us to do. Friends, what Christians are first and primarily called to do, what the church is called to do, is not to change civic policy is not to invest ourselves in politics, is not to make sure that the next person in the White House is a person who believes the Bible. Now, that may not be something contrary. It's not incompatible, but that's not the mission of the church. That's not the responsibility given to us as Christians. If you want to change your country and change your world, there are ways you might be able to do it through the influence of politics and policy. But our collective task, our unique responsibility as children of God, is to glorify Jesus Christ, who has called us to be part of a better country, to be a citizen of that holy nation, a people for God's own possession. So Christian, love God. And because you love God, love your neighbor, and yes, love your nation. Seek the good of others. But never allow anything or anyone to take the place that God and God alone should occupy in your heart and in your life. Ultimately, we don't pledge allegiance to anyone or anything before we give our loyalty to God.